liquid gold or toxic waste? You decide. That's this week on Motoring 99. TSN's Motoring 99 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas Car Care, the way it should be. There's no doubt that today's vehicles are more reliable, cleaner, and fuel efficient. And hopefully you don't have to spend as much time in the service bay as they used to. Hello everybody and welcome to Motoring 99. But you know, despite this efficiency, you still have to get your oil changed. As Bill Gardner likes to tell us time and time again, it is the key to a healthy engine. Well, would you believe in 1997, over 50 million oil changes took place in this country and that doesn't include heavy machinery. So the question is, what happens to all this used toxic oil? Well, we can only hope that shop owners and do-it-yourselfers dispose of the oil responsibly. Well, for the company that produces the number one selling brand of motor oil in this country, that is simply not good enough. There's about a billion liters of lubricating oil that's sold in Canada on an annual basis, of which about half of that is used up in the process. Unfortunately, there's about 150 million liters that go unaccounted for, and this is why we're very concerned about used motor oil programs, not only for the do-it-yourselfer, but for the installer. Several years ago, we introduced a program called the EnviroWare system, and we partnered up with Safety Clean at that time. And what it consisted of was a drum within a drum, which were both steel, and the uh, auto parts stores could collect used oil from the do-it-yourselfer when they brought it back for return. And when we introduced that program, that was at a time when, particularly in Ontario, there was to be regulations placed where if you sold motor oil, you had to provide a facility for the do-it-yourselfer to bring it back and dispose of it properly. Well, since then, the regulation didn't come down, but we did press on with our EnviroWare program. As of today, three western provinces have a system put in place that's called the Environmental Handling Charge System, and it's a levy. And it's a self-funding model where an EHC is charged per liter, and it not only collects the oil, it also collects the used oil filters as well as the containers, and it's working extremely well. In the other provinces, however, like Ontario and BC, as well as Quebec, there's no set regulation. So we've taken upon ourselves to introduce what we call our EnviroAware 2 system that is, assists our installers with the collection of used oil. Now an installer just calls 1-800-SAFETY-CLEAN and the used oil is picked up and the invoice actually comes right to Quaker State. What this does is it allows the installer peace of mind where they don't have to worry about where the used oil is going. We teamed ourselves up with the used oil collector that is the leader in the category and that way it makes it very easy turnkey for the installer to do business with us. We've been involved with the program for uh, two years. They come and pick up the used oil from our tanks. Uh, we don't have to call them, they do it automatically. They take it away and recycle it. Uh, it's great to see the oil reused and recycled and uh, it used to be dumped in sewers or dumps or wherever. Um, we do a lot of oil changes. Um, it's a big part of our business. Uh, we've just taken the engine oil out of the engine in the car in my bay and it gets pumped from this tank into this holding tank to be picked up for recycling. Uh, we also take our used engine oil filters and they're also picked up for recycling as well. We operate our used oil collection service in three provinces, being Quebec, Ontario and Alberta. From there, the majority of the oil makes its way back to our Breslau re-refinery, uh, where it is re-refined into uh, a very high quality base stock, ready to be made back into motor oils as uh, you and I as a consumer would know it. Overall, the, the used oil business has not grown uh, all that much. Uh, through stewardship programs like we have with, uh, with Quaker State, uh, we can get access to more of it for re-refining. 
and uh, it really is the best form of handling a uh, waste such as used oil. Do-it-yourselfers still make up about 40 percent of the market, so a significant amount of used oil that is generated by them. Fortunately, a lot of uh, major retailers in Canada have taken it upon themselves on a voluntary basis to allow the do-it-yourselfer to bring back their used oil to their locations, whether they purchased it there or not. The amount of business that we, we could have, uh, uh, we currently import uh, a tremendous amount of feedstock being used oil from the bordering uh, states of, of uh, the United States of America just to feed our one refinery uh, located in Breslau. And uh, there's an awful lot of it being poured down the sewer. Uh, there's also a significant amount of the used oil generated in Canada which uh, goes for fuel burning, basically just for its BTU value. And uh, we really find that a shame, uh, just for the fact that, uh, uh, you know, petroleum-based lube oils, it's a non-renewable resource. It can be refined and re-refined and used over and over and over again, and uh, it never wears out. It just gets dirty, and we have a way of cleaning it up. Yeah, it's really astonishing, particularly in Ontario, where the majority of oil is sold in the country, and it's been very disheartening because we entered into a program starting back in 91, and a regulation was to have come down in, uh, by 93, and to date we're heading into the next millennium, and there still is no regulation in uh, Canada's largest province to deal with this issue. And we really hope that we do get a level playing field like we have in the three western provinces, and that the rest of the country matches up with a similar solution so we have one size fits all for Canada. The policy here is there's not one pound of waste goes to landfill in a year. Nothing. It's an amazing process. Everything is reused. On the safety front, the Windstar is an all-star, getting five-star ratings for both front passengers and a frontal impact. When I tested the original Windstar, I suggested that it came up one seat short of a van load, if you get my drift. Well, for 1999, they've completely re-engineered the van and now claim it to be best in class. Power comes from a 3.8-litre V6 that's good for an even 200 horsepower and, more importantly, in a van application, 242 pounds-feet of torque at 3,250 RPM. The broad nature of the torque plateau does two things. First, it gives the Windstar a strong launch off the line, and second, the van feels lively even when loaded with a full complement of passengers or cargo. My only gripe is that when forced to work, the motor makes its presence known. A little more sound insulation or better isolation would not go amiss. Match for this engine is a decent four-speed automatic with overdrive. The shifts are smooth, the ratios well spaced, and the kick down willing to drop a cog when you need to pass a slower moving vehicle. The driver's environment is up to snuff. All of the power controls sit on the door panel. The cruise control functions on the steering wheel. You've got a good set of analog instrumentation. The warning light for the overdrive sits on the dash where it should do. And the radio and climate controls feature large buttons. The radio even gets a knob for volume. And then you get this thing, which I think is a real plus for anybody that's got kids. You can keep a BDI on them whilst you're driving. But then all of that counts for nothing. There must be a better way of getting that wire from the headlining to the rearview mirror. The Windstar rides on McPherson struts and a roll bar up front and a twist beam axle with gas pressurised shocks in back. For a van, the Windstar fared reasonably well in the pylon test. Its only hindrance being the armchair approach to the suspension's calibration. There is a lot of body roll and out on the open road, the van seems to float. That said, the rack and pinion steering delivers quick turn-ins and retains a decent on-centre feel. Stopping power comes in the form of front discs, rear drums and full anti-lock. Throw the anchor out and it takes 118 feet to stop from 80k. The soft suspension allows quite a bit of nosedive at the limit, but not so much as to be a concern. 
During the original road test, I complained about two key things. No fourth door, well that's obviously been solved. The second thing was no true five-seater configuration. Well, when they re-engineered the van, they reconfigured the floor so you can now put the back seat in the center position. That means you can carry five people and all of their luggage with ease. With the center seats removed and the third row bench moved forward to the middle position, you have access to 50.2 cubic feet of storage space. On the safety front, the Windstar is an all-star, getting five-star ratings for both front passengers and a frontal impact. By way of reference, a five-star rating means the front passengers are up to 50% less likely to sustain serious injury than a vehicle with a four-star rating. There are also dual front airbags as well as optional head and thorax side airbags. Over and above that, you get a traction control system that can be switched off if the need arises. The Windstar was already a very successful van. However, adding the fourth door and addressing the five passenger situation can only help its cause. Now, if only they can firm the suspension up and address some of the fit and finish issues, they'll have it made in the shade. As you may recall from our last update on the Grand Vitara, we had to use some sticky tape to cure a funny kazoo-like noise that was coming from a plate down on the firewall. Well, as it turns out, we weren't alone in our concerns, as Glenn Woodcock, who writes for the Toronto Sun, had the exact same problem. After talking to Glenn, we heard from the quality control department at the Cami plant in Ingersoll, Ontario. They've passed our concerns onto the engineering team, who in turn are going to come up with a fix. Other than that, Life with a Vitara is simply grand. I think you guys will be uh, familiar with the MR2, which is our mid-engine two-seater sports car that we sold for a number of years. A very popular vehicle in Canada and America, North American market. Given the prowess in the pylon test and the fact that the suspension is tuned specifically for performance, I was surprised by just how compliant it actually is on the road. We will look to replace that vehicle probably from the year 2000. And the MRS, although it's a concept car, has many styling cues and lots of the technology that will point towards our next sports vehicle, if you like. It's been purely designed for the sports driver, the guy who loves to, uh, to enjoy driving. It's got a sequential sports shift gearbox. It's got a 1.8 litre variable valve time petrol engine with around 140 horsepower. And the engine, of course, is behind the front seat, so it gives you that wonderful mid-engine sports car balance. It's going to be a joy to drive, and we're really looking forward to selling it to you guys. Our Midas tip of the week concerns boosting late model cars. One problem a lot of people run into is the fact that the battery terminals on a lot of late model cars are blocked or completely covered by some other component. This car is a perfect example. The battery is completely covered and the air cleaner is in the way of our positive post. But if we look over here, you find this bright red cover that's marked battery positive and that's where your red positive cable goes to make your connection. Your negative cable is going to go on to a clean bolt on the engine that's, that makes a good ground. A couple of other things you should remember, don't let the vehicles touch. You don't necessarily have to have the live vehicle running and in many cases I find that it's helpful to turn the headlights on on the dead vehicle. That way when I get the connections clean and tight I'll see the headlights jump to life. I know that I've made a good connection. That's your Midas tip of the week. All right, now, to show you how the process works visually, this is used oil as it comes out of your automobile. This comes into the plant where we distill it into a medium and light vacuum distilled oil. We have two byproducts. One is asphalt and the other is a light fuel oil. The fuel oil we use in our own furnaces to, to fire the refinery and we sell some fuel oil that's surplus to that. Then the vacuum oil is run through the hydro treater and we have a medium and light finished lube oil. The, this material is then used as a base stock to which we add additives and formulations to make things such as automatic transmission fluid, uh, hydraulic oil for the automobile industry, uh, Ford Motor, General Motors and th people of that kind. And then the last product I have here is your 10W30 which everybody is familiar with. 
It was a few years ago when motoring visited Oil City, Pennsylvania, aptly named because it was the site of the very first oil well in the United States. And Quaker State refines its oil just outside of Oil City. We're now in the Burlington, Ontario plant, and all the Quaker oil destined for Canada is packaged here. And as we saw earlier, the company is doing its best to make sure that someday all of this oil will be recycled. All right, it's now time to head to the garage and join Mr. Quaker State himself, Bill Gardner. Bill? Well, Brad, a guy like yourself is probably old enough to uh, remember a day probably about 30 years ago when they actually used to take waste motor oil and in rural areas, municipalities used to use it to lay dust on gravel roads. It was considered acceptable practice, but obviously that waste motor oil would enter the water table and contaminate the groundwater, and we certainly don't want to be doing things like that. So uh, it's great news that you know, over the years we've, we've come up with ways to, to lessen the impact of the automobile on the environment. We know that the automobile has a significant impact on our environment, so anything that can be done to uh, recycle, reuse, and, and lessen that impact is great. Now what I want to talk about this week is the constrained nature of the engine bay on today's cars. Matter of fact, the last 10 or 15 model years of cars, the engine bay is getting very tight and it's getting hard to get at some of the components we have to service. But some manufacturers have taken particular steps to make it easy to get to things simply by literally moving the engine. Now this mid-size Olds Cutlass is a perfect example of many of today's front wheel drive cars. Transverse mounted V6 engine driving the front wheels of this car. Now we've got uh, quite a bit of machinery under the hood here and you can see how everything is fairly tightly grouped here. And at the back of this V6 engine you've got three spark plugs that have to be serviced occasionally. Very, very hard to get out because of the gap back there, but there's a way of getting at it and we'll get to that in just a minute. Same with the alternator bolts. The alternator has to be replaced quite frequently on these particular cars. This one, as a matter of fact, is only a couple of days old. And the bolts that you get at for the, the anchor bolts at the base of the alternator, also hard to get out. That coolant pipe that runs along in the back of the firewall was replaced a few months ago, also very hard to get out. Now when we get to the front of this engine, getting the front three spark plugs are as simple as just removing the two screws that hold this coolant overflow bottle and then moving the coolant overflow bottle up and out of the way and that gets us to these three plugs and all the plug wires where they go on to the ignition coils. Now if we want to get to everything at the back of that engine bay like the back three spark plugs and the alternator, all those items we mentioned as being tough to get at, it's a pretty simple deal. In this car they've left you provision to move the engine. What you do is unbolt these two torque struts here and here. <coughs> these struts uh, control the top of the engine, prevent it from uh, twisting excessively on the mounts and the torque strut, this particular one is cracked and needs to be replaced, but they'll flip up and out of the way and then we can move the coolant bottle completely out of the way. Now when we get to the second torque strut, we'll unbolt it as well and set the nut aside and the gun and we'll pull this bolt out and what we're going to do now is pry the engine ahead on the mounts and we're just going to pry the engine forward until the slave hole aligns with the bolt and stick the bolt through into the mount and that pins the engine forward just a couple of inches and that couple of inches that dimension right there is how much we've moved it forward but when you look at the back of the engine now it's opened up a pretty substantial gap for me to get into the back of the engine with a spark plug socket and extension and get the three spark plugs out back here when I want to do a tune up now believe me it may not look like much to you but this gap is pretty substantial in terms of today's cars for somebody as big and ugly as me to be able to get in there and move around like this it's plenty of room now over here, this coolant pipe right here, I had to replace this a couple of months ago and once again moving the engine forward was the easy way to tackle that job. And just the other day I had to re replace the alternator on this car and moving the engine forward gives me enough clearance to swing the wrenches and get the lower mounting bolts in this alternator out. Now all three of these items, the alternator, coolant pipe and spark plugs and tune-up would have all been uh, virtually impossible to do without pinning the engine forward. Now as we're starting to see some larger vehicles come down the line, hopefully we're going to get a couple more inches here and there to get at some of these items but uh, as you can see they've taken special provision on this car to let us in there and get us in there and repair some of these items. Till next week I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 99. A new twist on photo radar that's coming up next on Kenzie's Corner. A few years ago, I was driving in Korea. Now, one of the traffic control measures they use there, 
as mannequins dressed up to look like radar police officers. The theory is you see a policeman, you slow down. There was one small problem. They bought the mannequins in California. So you had six foot three inch tall, blonde, blue eyed, fair skinned policemen. How long do you figure it took the Korean drivers to figure that one out? Now, the residents of this community in western Toronto have decided to do a similar thing, but they're a little more clever. They've used one of their own local officers and got a picture of him. There's Constable Steve Kemley. Isn't he a good looking guy? Again, there's a small fly in this ointment. You're driving in Toronto in the middle of winter, you see a police officer wearing a short sleeve shirt. You figure that's either one tough cop or he's made of cardboard. Now there's another small problem here. If you've got a big wide street like this, four lanes, perfect pavement, sight lines forever, people are gonna go faster than 60 kilometers an hour. And I'm not sure there's enough police officers, real or cardboard, to make a material difference in that speed. If you didn't wanna go that fast, you shouldn't have built a road that's this good. You wanna slow people down? There is one way to do it, and I've told you that on this show before. You build a one foot wide, one foot deep ditch right across this road every 100 meters. Oh, you're going to get lawsuits for damage suspension. The residents are going to be up in arms. But I'm afraid that's the only way it's going to be done. The community is going to have to decide. Are they prepared to give up some mobility in return for slower speeds? That's the only choice they really have. I'm Jim Kenzie. Now, this logo indicates that this container is recyclable, and it is. But you see, the oil must be cleaned out first before they will recycle the actual container. Now, in Alberta, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan, there's an infrastructure set up so the containers are cleaned of oil and then they're recycled. Now, in all the other provinces, there is no collection process. The result, these end up in landfill. Now, they've been talking about changing that for over 10 years, but you know what they say about talk. And you know what? It's a shame. Anyway, that's it for now, but make sure you join us next week as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. It's the Pontiac enthusiast now. We, we, we've tailored and we've catered to the Chevrolet enthusiast with the Camaro SS, and now we're listening to the Pontiac side of it, and they want the Trans Am. That's what they want. TSN's Motoring 99 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas Car Care, the way it should be.